Even in death, even with half of his head blown clean away, his body refuses to yield. His mighty figure cutting swathes through his foes was truly monstrous, and over the course of his battles he received a full 267 blade wounds. The bullets he endured totaled 152, and the cannonballs he has withstood amount to 46. And yet, upon the proud back of this legendary man, or indeed upon his very life as a pirate, he bears no single wound of cowardice. If you want to find an example of a truly perfect supporting character, you need look no further than Edward Newgate, aka Whitebeard, and his role in the story of One Piece. Oda does a wonderful job of making him one of the most badass and influential characters in the series. And he does it in a very interesting way. He introduces Whitebeard as the strongest pirate in the series, while at the same time utilizing every single aspect of his character as a powerful storytelling device. As you might know, many supporting characters in your average story usually serve at least one of two purposes. Make them interact with the main character so we can engage with them and thus advance the story, or supply us with some new pieces of information about the world that our story takes place in. With Whitebeard, Oda does both. He uses the Emperor to vastly expand our understanding of the One Piece world and sets the stage for the second half of the plot in the New World. And at the same time, Oda also flashes out his character to be one of the most important and powerful players in the story. And I believe that this was a really smart move. Because what makes Whitebeard so popular and exciting as a character, at least on the surface, is not what he teaches us about the world, but who he is as a person. The strongest man alive. The pirate respected and feared by all and the man who went head to head with the world government by starting the world the best. And so I think it's more than just adequate that in this video we will be discussing not one, but two aspects of Whitebeard's character. How he drastically expanded our view of the One Piece world, and why he was the next unofficial pirate king after Goldie Roger. Before I go and explain how ingeniously Oda has used Whitebeard as a world-building element and how critical he was in setting up the second half of the story, I think I first have to justify myself for saying that Whitebeard was the second Pirate King. That's a pretty bold statement after all, believe me, I know. But if you bear with me here, I promise it will all make sense once we make it to the end of this video. So let's start from zero and steadily build our way towards Pirate King material. Because to truly understand Whitebeard's character, we first have to understand the underlying theme around which Oda has created his design. Idealism. If I made you forget everything you knew about Edward Newgate and his actions in the story, and then asked you to think about what the ideal pirate in One Piece for you would look like, I bet most people would come up with either one of two categories. Power or personality. After all, what sets Luffy apart from other characters in the story are pretty much these two things. There are a number of characters that are as compassionate and strong-willed as Luffy, and there are also many characters that are as strong or maybe even stronger than him. And so in the end, what really makes Luffy so unique is that he's both. However, while Luffy still has to grow as a person over the course of the story and has to train in order to become stronger, with Whitebeard, Oda shows us what an ideal candidate for Pirate King should look like in the end. I strongly believe that he's the ultimate role model in terms of strength and character for Luffy to follow. And so let's take a look in detail at how Oda created Whitebeard within these two categories. When Whitebeard was first introduced way back in chapter 234, Oda gave him the epithet of strongest man in the world for a reason. While I think it's fair to debate whether he was actually stronger than Roger, whether Kaido as the strongest creature in the world might have been even more powerful, and whether he was already way beyond his prime at Marineford, I think what isn't up for debate is that for at least two decades, Edward Newgate was the most powerful human in the One Piece world, period. On the most basic level, this was of course due to his enormous physical strength, equipped with powerful hockey and of course, 
due to his powerful devil fruit, the Guragura no Mi, that is said to hold the power to destroy the entire world. In all the encounters he has at Marineford, whether it be a Kainu or a Blackbeard, he always seems to have the edge, despite his countless wounds and illnesses. And of course, we could witness his true power in his clashes with Odin and Roger, both of which were considered to be monsters themselves in terms of brute strength. Additionally, he was a more than capable swordsman, wielding one of the 12 supreme Mato swords that he most likely turned into a black blade over his lifetime. But beyond these monstrous physical abilities, Whitebeard also held enormous tactical power. As one of the Yonko, he commanded an enormous crew and an even larger fleet of affiliated pirates. And especially after Roger's execution and the end of their rivalry, Whitebeard, who also had the second highest bounty after Roger, used his personal and military power, and in combination with a very sharp and tactical mind, to ultimately be the one to control large parts of the oceans and to keep the balance in the new world. Just how strong his grip on the world actually was became especially clear after the war, where as a result of his death, the balance of the world was dealt a devastating blow. Countless islands under his protection fell into anarchy and were invaded by other pirates. And the power vacuum he left behind gave room for new players to gain influence in the new world, including the likes of Luffy and Blackbeard. And speaking of Whitebeard's legacy, his death at Marineford, in my opinion, might be one of the most misunderstood scenes in the entire story. Many people like to accuse Whitebeard of not being the man he once was at Marineford, and as a result badly overestimating his own strength. However, as I see it, Oda made it pretty much clear that he never had the intention of surviving the war in the first place. Instead, it should be his ultimate proof of pride and power. In other words, Whitebeard went to Marineford to die. He purposefully removed the medication he was hooked to that was keeping him alive. He joined the fight heads-on without any regard for his health or his life to prove to the world that he could still fight with the big shots. The thing that Whitebeard feared the most then was being pitied for his condition, and so he decided that he'd rather go out with a bang rather than slowly waste away on board of his ship. His true intention for the war then was to free Ace and make him his successor and the top candidate for the next Pirate King. And so this, in my opinion, is one of the strongest displays of honor, strength and will that we've seen in all of One Piece outside of the Straw Hats. Another point I think is important to make when considering Oda's portrayal of Whitebeard is his source of inspiration for the character in the first place. Primarily, there are two major characters whose attributes have been united in the Emperor. The first is the real-life Blackbeard. His character has been an inspiration for both White and Blackbeard for two reasons. First, his name, Edward Teach which Oda has split into Edward Newgate and Marshall D. Teach. And secondly, his reputation as one of the most infamous real pirates in our world. And what this shows us is that Oda has actively chosen the most recognizable example of a true pirate as the basis for Whitebeard's character. But there is also a second figure, this time from Japanese folklore, that also plays a major role here. I'm speaking of the character of Benke, a legendary Japanese warrior monk who was said to have lived in the latter years of the Heian period in the 12th century. Benkei was notoriously known for his superhuman strength as well as his strong sense of loyalty. The monk was said to be at least five times the size of a normal man and wielded a naginata as his weapon of choice, the same long-range type of blade as Murakumogiri, the blade that Whitebeard wields. However, the deed Benkei is most known for is dying against an overwhelming force of enemies, standing upright and riddled by arrows and spears. Oda chose these obvious parallels for a reason. They are what make Whitebeard into the proud, strong and fearless pirate that he is. Only he, being Roger's equal, would have been able to start a second era of piracy. Because to become pirate king, one needs to be a true ideal of strength and power. Now, while willpower, strength and influence are certainly basic requirements for becoming Pirate King, 
There are actually a number of candidates that would fall into this category that literally nobody would want to see on top of the food chain. Except for Ryan. What the hell's wrong with you, Ryan? So what makes Roger or Luffy different from, let's say, a Blackbeard or a Kaido? I would argue that it's compassion and kindness that makes for an ideal pirate king. At least in my, and probably also Oda's eyes. Both Roger and Luffy represent the quote-unquote good pirate that helps the weak and strives for justice, freedom, and happiness. And that's what sets them apart from other strong characters in One Piece. And therefore, I think that this also serves as an argument that Whitebeard also held the unofficial role of Pirate King, as he's not only an ideal of power and strength, but also of compassion and kindness. While he easily could have reached Love Tail as well, he never cared to find the One Piece in the first place. What Newgate was actually looking for was to form strong relationships and to find the family that he was denied as a child growing up as an orphan. While we do not know yet what he was like during his time with the Rocks Pirates, at least by the time he started his own crew, he was a cheerful and carefree young pirate roaming the seas. His primary mission in life was protecting the weak, and he did so by putting entire islands under his flag and by recruiting lost men into his crew by adopting them as his sons. He did so with Squirt, who lost his entire crew to Roger, with Ace, with Blackbeard, and many others that didn't have any other place to go. He also did not care much for race or status, and was the only one willing to stand up for the fishmen and end their exploitation through the humans. And I think another trait that shows whether someone is a truly great leader is by looking at how they treat their people. Compared to many of the other Yonko, Whitebeard had a truly great crew. Kaido, for instance, seems to rule over his men through power and fear. Blackbeard has surrounded himself with people hungry for power and blood. And Big Mom actually has made her real family into her crew, but doesn't even get close to the level of warmth and joy that the Whitebeard pirates had. The secret behind this is that Whitebeard has built his crew predominantly on trust, love and respect. Thus, similar to his inspiration Benkei, Loyalty is the major theme of the Whitebeard Pirates, which is also what makes Blackbeard's betrayal of said loyalty the ultimate crime for the crew. And something I feel is directly connected to this idea is the strong moral code that Newgate has. Loyalty and respect are what the Emperor values most highly. What makes him different from, let's say, a Kainu, however, who actually shares surprisingly similar ideals, is that Whitebeard has the ability to forgive. In that sense, the scene with Squirt is actually way more important for Whitebeard's characterization than you might have realized. Despite betraying his trust and loyalty, just as Blackbeard did, and stabbing him through the back, Whitebeard forgives him by being compassionate and understanding his true motivations. Because while Blackbeard betrayed him for power, Squirt was manipulated by Akainu into believing that he would be sacrificed for Ace's sake. The fact that Whitebeard is actually able to distinguish between these two cases is pretty much the exact opposite to Akainu's concept of absolute justice, which is also why the conflict between the two works so wonderfully well. They in fact do share a number of views and values, but in the decisive area of morality, they're the complete opposite of each other. It is also no wonder then that Whitebeard quickly grew to enormously respect Luffy, Odin and Roger, all of which share these two fundamental traits of strength and compassion as well, and could thus change the world for the better. And this is exactly why I believe that while he never even tried to find the One Piece in the first place, after Roger's death, Whitebeard effectively became the next Pirate King and Ruler of the Seas. The point here is of course not that Whitebeard was exactly like Roger, just as Roger was never exactly like Luffy. This would not only make little sense, but would also be extremely boring. No. Each of the three has of course their unique personality and a unique path to follow. What unites them, however, are these central traits that Oda presents to us as the requirements to become the ideal pirate. Or, in other words, the stuff that makes a pirate king. So, now that we've discussed how Oda has created the, in my opinion, fantastic character of Whitebeard in the context of the story, 
In the last part of this video, I want to explore how this character also serves as a strong device for world building. And what we've discussed so far hopefully will help you understand better what makes all of this so genius. Because in more than just one way, the introduction of Whitebeard as a character also introduced to us several crucial aspects of the One Piece world that were desperately needed to progress the plot. First of all, Whitebeard introduced to us the old generation. Through his actions and fights, we were able to witness the monstrous power that the likes of Roger, Garp and Rox must have held when they were roaming the seas during their prime. It gives us a sense of way greater powers being at work in the One Piece world than we originally thought. Physical and political conflicts suddenly were on a completely different level. And this already brings me to my second point, setting a new standard. This new spectrum of strength and influence that came with Whitebeard and his war against the Marines was introduced as a new measuring stick for Luffy and the crew to strive towards. It showed us just how much there was still to learn and to explore, and how far they actually still were from getting even close to playing at the top level. In retrospect, it was Oda basically shouting at us that a time skip was about to come, and that Luffy needed a significant change in character and a new drive to become stronger. Whitebeard's death, meanwhile, rang in the end of this old era and gave rise to the new one, making space for Luffy and also others to grow in. This of course also included Blackbeard, whose character arc in many ways has been about opposing and ultimately killing off the last remaining ideal pirate, and thus pushing Luffy to fill this newly created vacuum. So not only did Whitebeard significantly expand our understanding of the One Piece world, but he also set up the entirety of the New World Saga by giving the story a fresh start and at the same time, with Blackbeard introducing the ultimate antagonist for Luffy, that in more than just one way can be considered the anti-pirate king, that needs to be kept away from gaining power at all costs. After all, what we want is an ideal pirate king. What we want is someone as worthy for the title as the strongest man in the world. Another character that has had enormous impact on Luffy and his journey is another emperor, Shanks. You can find out what his role in the story is and what role Nordic mythology plays for his character by clicking right here. Peace guys.